hello and welcome. Good afternoon to our English language guided tour through our museum stack number two, which is dedicated to the age or the ages of sail. We'd like to start, of course, at the very beginning of uh, the sailing ages. But before we do this, I have to ask you for a favor. You know, these are dark times for culture and we are doing these tours for you online for free. But if you like them, if you want to help them, just leave us a little donation. You can do it via PayPal or directly to our accounts. The information will be visible on our website and on this Facebook place here soon. And if you can't find them, simply ask in the comments section. Our colleague will give them to you immediately. By the way, our museum shop is also open and has a beautiful online shop where you can order your tickets for your next visit next year in better days. So now let's start. On to the ages of sail. Here we have a beautiful little diorama showing the boats of the famous Polynesian seafarers. A maritime superculture, as you can call them. They conquered a whole ocean on these vessels, starting with these outrigger canoes in front of here, and then for the great, great, great migration waves across the Pacific Ocean, they used these huge double hulled canoes. Um, and on these vessels, they could endure for weeks, even months at sea having with them not only their cargo, but also their livestock. And to find these islands beyond the horizon, um, their navigators had a wonderful skills. They could read the water. They could tell from the sign of, of the shape of a wave where land would be to find. They could tell from certain clouds in the sky well, land is, or uh, simply by uh, looking at migrating birds. So they really knew what they do. And um, with these skills, these people even reached South America centuries before Columbus and traded, for example, with the Inca. So very, very interesting culture. Not very well known in Europe, but you should know them. So if you find the time, simply study a bit about their great history and see. It's astonishing. Now we're going onward to something new. In this showcase, we see a beautiful trireme from Athens, from antiquity. These vessels probably were at sea from eight 100 BC onward, and they have their names trireme from the three rows of oars that are above each other. And if they were pulled by a skilled crew, there was an enormous manpower and, of course, the very fine speed needed for ramming the enemy with this device in front of the ship. So they rammed it with full speed into the ship's hull of the enemy and then they entered the ship with the sword in hand. And to make sure that they have enough, enough men to conquer an enemy, the men at the oars were not slaves as portrayed in numerous movies which are false in that aspect. They were pulled of course by the soldiers themselves. They were skilled, they were trained, and they had the motivation to lead their ship to victory. So it was a better idea to have free men at the oars. Now, going to the next maritime high culture. This would be in the Middle Ages, of course, the Vikings from Northern Europe. Here depicted via some models of their really, really beautiful ships. The Polynesians that we initially saw 
are called by some scientists the Vikings of the South Sea or the Southern Ocean. That is, of course, uh, meant to, to honor them because they were the second culture, together with the Vikings, who conquered as settlers the whole ocean very long time ago. As you, of course, know, the Vikings, they uh, discovered Vinland in North America, probably the, well, the coasts around um, Newfoundland or a bit south of there. There must have been Vinland and they landed there in the year two, uh, 1000. So it's quite long ago, 500 years before Columbus. And these ships enabled them to do so because they were as this trading ship here, they used these trading ships to cross the ocean, not the long boats that we've seen at first. These ships were very sturdily built. They were fast. They could be both sailed and rowed. And they um, were technologically masterpieces that were developed from a couple of centuries before Christ, then re reached their, their, their um, full power in around the year 700 and that was the year when probably the Viking ship as we knew it came into being. So this ship was the best ship type in the European Middle Ages. And if you were on a raid with such a long ship here shown, you were so fast that the people only recognized you coming when it was too late. And they could be they, they could land these boats, the Vikings could land these boats on a shore, then run to a raid, probably to a monastery and raid them, and then disappear very quick, because they could then just shove their ship back into the water the other way around and sail away so quickly that no enemy force could um, reach them. So it was a very safe deal to make a raid with if you had a Viking ship. Okay, that is enough for the Vikings today. Now I'm going to go with you to China. This is a very huge model depicting a very special kind of junk, Chinese junk. It's called a Bao Chuan or treasure ship. These ships were said to have sailed from 1405 onward as the flagships of a gigantic fleet commanded by famous Chinese Admiral Cheng He or Cheng He. And this Admiral got an order by his emperor, the emperor of the name of Yongle. He should sail with this gigantic fleet led by ships of 140 meters in length and 50 meters in beam, propelled by nine masts until the southern and eastern oceans. So they sailed to Southeast Asia, they sailed to India, to Persia, to the Arabian Peninsula and to East Africa to make trade contracts with the local emperors um, or leaders. So it was for the most part a very peaceful mission and they had not only these giant ships, they had warships, trade ships, ships for agriculture, ships to transport horses or livestock. And they had on board up to 300, near 30,000 people, not only sailors and military personnel, but also scientists, artists, diplomats. So everything, uh, the Ming Empire, China was back then under the Ming Dynasty, um, could offer to the world. It was a swimming Chinese city, you could say. And they embarked on seven of these voyages up to uh, 1433 or 35, it depends on what you read. And then a new emperor, to make a long story short, finally <coughs> decided that these uh, journeys were <coughs> too expensive and, and he stopped them to have the money they would cost free at his hand for important of, of projects that he deemed to be more important in these days. So they left the high seas with this fleet exactly at that time 
when the Portuguese on the other side of Africa, remember the Chinese reached East Africa, the Portuguese were on the other side on the western coasts, where the Portuguese um, embarked on their quest to find a sea route to India. Um, it's just a nice little thought to imagine what would have happened if this fleet would have met in case the Chinese did not abandon their huge fleet. I think these vessels were so big and the Portuguese caravel was so small, it would have been an encounter of the third kind for the Portuguese to run into these Chinese, but of course it never happened. But now on to the Portuguese. They were great seabirds on their own right. In their own right. Here is one of these caravels, the ship type mainly used for the quest to find the sea route to India. They were also very seaworthy ships. They were fast, good, maneuverable, mm -hmm. and they had not a very big draught, so they could sail in coastal waters, even rivers, without uh, having a, a huge risk. So they were very suited for explorers. But why wanted the Portuguese go to India? The main reason was the spices. The spices from the East, they were famous in Europe, even in the Middle Ages, but unaffordable for the most people. They were so expensive because they had to be traded in from the, from the Arabs or the Venetians. Yeah, the Venetians also made special trade contracts with the Arabs and then they had a monopoly uh, to, which allowed them to sell these spices to the other Europeans for even higher prices. And one day, well, the Portuguese said, well, let's go to India ourselves. We know it is somewhere in the east beyond Africa. So let's sail the west coast of Africa, southbound, and find out if Africa will end at some point and can be rounded. And that was 70 years later. The endeavor was started in 1418. 70 years later, Bartolomeu Diaz rounded the Cape of Good Hope for the first time. He recognized that he reached the other side, but then was forced by his men to return finally home. And it was 10 years later when Vasco da Gama, even the Portuguese, of course, finally reached the city of Calicut in the south of India and opened the new trade route for the Europeans. And these journeys, of course, also paved the way for the first European colonial empires. And then the Spaniards came. They also discovered India, but in a very, very different place. And of course, it was in fact America. That was in 1492. And um, now there were, there were two Catholic sea powers um, engaged in, in competition with each other until to avoid war with the help of the Pope they negotiated the Treaty of Tordesillas and um, that treaty was implemented in 1494 and it divided the world into a western hemisphere which would belong to the kings of Spain for all time and an eastern hemisphere containing the yet undiscovered sea route to India for the Portuguese kings forever. And all the other European countries were excluded from this treaty. And what could they do? Well, they started um, to fight this via sending their pirate ships, their corsairs to the Caribbean and in the east, to the eastern waters to raid the Spaniards and the Portuguese. <coughs> so, also the age of piracy. Again, or the golden age of piracy. That is. So, onward to another topic. This book shaped showcase is dedicated to the overseas trading companies. These trading companies were founded 
after the sea routes to both India and to the Far East and the Americas has been discovered and the merchantmen organized in these companies, they had very special privileges because only they had the privilege to trade in a certain region of the world. Those regions were called the West Indies, which is the Caribbean and both Americas, and the East Indies, which is India, Southeast Asia and the Far East. So these companies were divided in East Indian and West Indian companies. And these companies were so powerful that you could call them early global players. They were allowed by their kings to declare and wage wars by themselves. And thus, of course, also paving the way for colonialism, because at first only trade was intended, but then came the soldiers, the weapons, the gunboats, and all the suffering implemented by colonialism. The East Indian trading companies were so powerful that, for example, the British East Indian Company managed it to somehow get the control over all of India, not at, at one giant move, but slowly over centuries. And it was as late as the second half of the 19th century that the British government finally um, made out of the possession of the company the colony of British India. So here you see what a global player of the, such dimensions could achieve back in those days. Well, the East Indian trading companies traded with, for the most part, spices, textiles and, and goods that were very luxurious, for example, like Chinese porcelain as depicted here. And the West Indian companies, they had a far more, well, cruel trade at their hands because they were engaged very much in the trade with African slaves. And we have dedicated this place of the museum to the suffering of these poor people. Um, here we have a depiction of a ship's cargo bay and you see the shadows of humans imprinted on them. That was intended by us to commemorate the immense suffering these people had to endure. Many millions of them were deported to, to um, the Americas back in the day, starting in the early 16th century, and it only ended in the somewhere in the 19th century, depending on which country you focus on. Brazil abandoned it as late as the 1880s. So, we don't know exactly how many were deported, but there are numbers in, in signs that uh, come from 7 to 20 million in, in these times. And the Europeans, they did this because they needed forced labor in their newfound possessions and colonies in, in the Americas. And a, a huge strategy um, implemented this for some part because the Native American population was um, not immune to the European diseases. So they died of many diseases which a European could easily endure. 90% of the native population perished within the first decades of contact with the Europeans. And so the, the, the colonial um, leaders, uh, their powers, they enslaved the Indians first. And when they died, they simply replaced them with the Africans, which is in total the most tragic and horrible chapter in the history of the so-called Christian seafaring. But also for the sailors on these, well, beautiful to look at sailing ships, life at sea was sometimes horrible and I will show you why. Many sailors did not embark on these ships because they wanted to, especially in the, in the navies. Many of them were forced. <coughs> they were persuaded in a very brutal way to join the navy by simply having hit with a club on their head and then, while unconscious, moved to the ships. And those men who then were, well, a bit, well, 
not so easy to persuade that this is now their great new fate. They were treated with this nice device. So for mistakes or for the wrong words to a superior officer, easily dozens of hits could be delivered with the cat of nine tails. And the punishment with the cat of nine tails was also called to give him a striped shirt. That meant it was bloody, red stripes all across your body. Here we have a, a log from the British East India Company where a seaman called Quinn is sentenced to 48 strokes because he has not correctly saluted his superior officer. So for very little things you could be harshly punished. And although it was brutal, most, we must admit, for the most time these punishments were survived because uh, what was back then something like a ship's doctor supervised the punishment and he ended it if the man um, suffered uh, too, too, too much blood loss or if they fell unconscious. So, but this was only one problem at sea, the punishments. Also, of course, um, other injuries and, and, of course, accidents cost a lot of life at sea, but also alcohol. Here we have a barrel of rum, it's a real one from back in the day. And um, the fact is that the seamen were given up to a quarter liter uh, rum a day to mix it with their drinking water, so the water will not um, be foul all too soon. But also large quantities of beer and wine, as much as was available, were handed out to the people. And especially the, the superior officers, they had their private quantities of liquor in their um, cargo and, and they, if they drank even more than the sailors. And many sailors back then died from the abuse of alcohol or from the consequences of being drunk and then suffering an accident. So the whip, alcohol and the third horror was disease. And that was the most horrible of them all. I give you one example. The most dreaded disease at sea was called scurvy. It was a very painful death suffered from vitamin C loss. And um, if you sent a trading ship to India and back to Britain, for example, you could be sure back in the day that 20% of your sailors will not survive the trip. So you really have to calculate your crew very well. So make sure that after the loss of 20%, the rest will bring the ship back to bay. These horrors at sea, like also the yellow fever, they only lost their horror in the course of the 19th century after um, a, well, the, some kind of a cure against scurvy was discovered. Um, the Scottish um, doctor James Lind discovered that if you give the man uh, um, lemons, scurvy will not break out. They didn't understand why, but they knew it would. And so scurvy lost its horror back in those days, but other diseases only when real ship doctors, real ship doctors who really knew what they were doing, were on board having these medicine crates on board. This is a wonderful exhibit. I think outside of Great Britain, this is the only medicine crate from a ship of back on those days, from the age of sail, which is still stuffed with the original ingredients. This is very rarely to be found. Most of these crates have not their original bottles in them, or, or if, and if they have, the bottles are cleaned and nothing is left of the ingredients. So this is one of our, I think, most interesting exhibits and it comes from a time when finally the horrors of sea called diseases lost 
their horror and seafaring became much more safe. Now I want to show you something about a very, very famous naval hero from England. That is, of course, Horatio Nelson, famous emperor, the victor of the Battle of Trafalgar and numerous other encounters at sea. Here you have his signature, his autograph, and this is his life mask. He looks a bit dead, but trust me, it was his, or it's a, a copy of his original life mask. And you see how small this face is. He was a great hero, lost many, uh, won, of course, many, many battles, but he was a very small and tiny man, probably only a little bit about 160 centimeters high. Not very healthy, he was seasick for all of his life. He lost an eye, he lost an arm, and um, so he was not all too well. Um, it can be depicted or can be shown if you look at the three famous autographs, this is a story for today, that he used in his life, and we have them in here. The first one, as he was, uh, well, he was writing with his right hand, like most of us, and so he wrote with his right hand the name Horatio Nelson. And after he lost his right aim, arm, his right arm, due to a battle against the Spanish, he had to change to the left hand and then he shoved the pencil across the paper and you can see it. It looks very different here. Horatio Nelson still, but a completely different handwriting. And when years later he was given the Duchy of Bronte in southern Italy by, by, by the king of, of, of Sicily, Naples, honoring his deeds in the fight against Napoleon. Then he said, well, now I'm a nobleman in Italy, so I write myself Nelson Bronte. And this is what you can see here in his third autograph. Well, this is the story about this famous man that only few people might knew. So today I wanted to give you something different about him and not only his naval battles, which are all too well known by you all. So now, onward to the last topic for today. Yeah, it ends so quickly. Well, we. things and all bad things tend to end at some point and so also the age of sail as we knew it at one point in history ended and that was when finally uh, the um, steamships came into being propelled by ships propellers and not sails they went under steam engines and they made seafaring much more faster and more planable and so very quickly the huge trading ships under sails like this one they disappeared and when they finally disappeared the last captains who commanded these ships cargo carrying sailing ships of huge dimensions around the infamous cape horn they founded the most exclusive um, brotherhood in the history of mankind the brotherhood of the cape horners they were founded for the first time, of course, in 1934 in France, then only for the French captains. And they had very, very strict rules of admission. They said, you can only join us if you were a captain who commanded a ship round Cape Horn in the direction from east to west facing the storms. You had to have cargo on board and you have, you must have had no auxiliary engines or something like that, only sails. And if you did this, you can become a Cape Horn. <coughs> Later on, they softened these the conditions a bit to make sure that also sailors who were on board of these ships could join the ranks of the Cape Horners. And uh, one thing that you should know, they must have become captains later on in their career. That is very important. And those who never became captains, 
could only enter the ranks as extraordinary members. In 1945, right after Second World War, these French captains said, well, now we want to open this brotherhood to the world. We become international. And in 1945, right after the horrors of World War II, they offered membership exactly also to the German captains. So this was probably the uh, first sign of um, friendship between the French and the Germans after this horrible war, which was of course started by the Germans. So it's a very, very good and wise sign by these captains. See if I must do these things. But I want to show you now how horrible a trip around Cape Horn must have been. We have two maps here on the wall. Here's a map that shows many sea, uh, many shipwrecks in the seas around Cape Horn. Sailing ships, steamships, they're all there. Uh, scientists believe that up to 10,000 shipwrecks are in this region alone. So this gives you only a very soft impression of what really happened there. And to grasp how hard a trip down Cape Horn could have been, I'd like to point your attention finally on the ship's route on this map. This is the route of a ship from our hometown, from, from Hamburg. The ship's name was Susanna. And in the winter of 1905, they fought against Cape Horn for 99 days, always facing the harshest of storms. Many captains would have abandoned the trip and sailed the other way around via Australia. But this man was not a guy to easily give up. His name was Captain Jürgens. And after 99 years, he managed the longest ever recorded trip around Cape Horn without losing a single man. But it was cold, it was raining, the wind was blowing, the ship was freezing, the men could hardly ever sleep a night through. Their clothes were soaked wet, and so the, 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 the pain they must have endured were, were so unimaginable to, to us today that now finally we can understand why these men insisted that only men who did this, really did this, could join the ranks of the Cape Horners. And I think that is very justified. So that's it for today. I hope we see you again live and in person here when the museum opens again and of course in the coming weeks we do a lot more of these tours for you of course all live and i hope you click um, to the link watch it enjoy it and then probably give a little donation so goodbye